Good morning. My name is Cameron McElhenney, and I serve as the Director of Training and Education for the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. Whether you are joining our webinar series for the first time or returning, I would like to welcome you to our webinar series where today we will discuss investigating search and seizure allegations. Before I turn things over to today's presenter, I would like to go over a few things regarding today's call. During the webinar, all attendees will be muted, but as soon as we begin, you will have the ability to type in any questions you might have for our presenter, Jennifer Jarrett. Following her presentation, your questions will be asked and answered as they have been received. During the webinar, you may also send any questions you might have for me as the webinar administrator in the same manner, and I will answer your questions as quickly as possible. At the conclusion of today's webinar, each of you will be given the opportunity to complete a brief survey on today's event. I ask that you please take a few moments to complete the survey as it will help us as we move forward with enhancing and expanding our webinar series. With our housekeeping duties out of the way, I would like to introduce you to today's presenter, Jennifer Jarrett. Ms. Jarrett is the Deputy Director of Training at the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Over her last 11 years with the agency, she has worked as an investigator and spent several years supervising dozens of investigators. Jennifer currently leads the new investigator training course and creates and leads continued and advanced training for the investigative staff. She was a co-presenter at the Evalu Evaluating Use of Force Lecture at the 2017 NACOL Annual Conference and is currently a member of the NACOL Training Education and Standards Committee. Jennifer? Great. Um, so first, I did want to say I have a little bit of a cough, so in case you hear that, I apologize in advance. Um, so let's get right to it. Ultimately, when people are having encounters with the police um, and they talk about, you know, I know my rights, they're usually referring to the Fourth Amendment in terms of what actions officers can take and what they think the law says. But there are actually many legal principles that are guiding the actions that police officers can take. So there are sources of law and rules guiding officers. In addition to the U.S. Constitution, there are also state constitutions, state statutes, which includes penal and criminal laws, courts, uh, federal versus state decisions by courts interpreting constitutions, statutes, and other court decisions, what we commonly refer to as case law. And then police department administrative trials as well, and police department operating procedures or patrol guides. And keep in mind that the U.S. Supreme Court is the highest court in the United States, but federal rules usually set the floor for rules or people's rights, not the ceiling. So it's the minimum standard. Uh, states can have higher standards than what the federal guidelines set. And so ultimately, when we are talking about the Fourth Amendment, um, which is search and seizure law as we think about it, it's concerned about government intrusion on people's liberty. So arrests, searches on the street, searches of the home, and it has come to include vehicle searches, surveillance with phone, email, GPS, etc. The Fourth Amendment protects protects unreasonable searches and seizures. Um, and the Supreme Court has really focused on the reasonableness of police conduct in these cases. The presumption is that a search or seizure without a warrant is unreasonable, absent narrow exceptions. But the Fourth Amendment talks about probable cause. So the question became, what happens if officers don't have probable cause? And so in 1968, there was a case called Terry v. Ohio, a Supreme Court case. It involved Officer McFadden, who'd been a police officer for 39 years. He was a detective for 35. He patrolled downtown Cleveland for 30 years. One afternoon, he observed two men who, quote, didn't look right. He saw them casing a store along with another man, and they were pacing back and forth pausing to stare in the store window, and he feared that they may have a gun. So he approached the three individuals, asked for their names, he frisked three men by patting down the outside of their clothing, and he eventually removed the overcoat of Terry and found a gun. So the question in that case for the Supreme Court is, is it always unreasonable for a policeman to seize a person and subject him to a limited search for weapons where there is no probable cause for arrest? And the answer was, no. Um, and actually, whenever an officer stops an individual and restrains his freedom to walk away, he has seized the individual. 
but a brief seizure seizure for criminal investigation or a stop can be justified on, quote, reasonable suspicion. So Terry's important because it sanctioned the practice of what we now call stop and frisk. The officers had reasonable suspicion based on experience that the petitioner and his companions were about to commit a daytime robbery, and his belief that the suspect was armed, dangerous, and posed a threat to him and to others justified the officer's stop and frisk of the petitioner in this case. Um, but it was limited in time and scope, only inside the coat where he felt the bulge. Police officers at this point had been doing stop and frisk, but now it was clear that one, the police-civilian interaction leading up to an arrest was still subject to Fourth Amendment protections, but two, police could be justified in doing stop and frisk even if they didn't have probable cause to arrest someone. And ultimately, we do want the police to be able to investigate and inquire about criminal activity. Um, so the focus on the court is wanting to find the basis to allow police flexibility in rapidly evolving street encounters, but it has to be a legitimate function. So the court acknowledges that police detention is a seizure covered by the Fourth Amendment, but the theory is that there are certain types of police investigative conduct that can be justified as reasonable, even though they are based on less than probable cause. So an officer can frisk, which is the limited pat-down of outer clothing for a weapon, if observations lead him to believe an individual is armed and presently dangerous. But again, this is the floor and not the ceiling. So although Terry v. Ohio is a U.S. Supreme Court case, states may have different cases that they use when they are analyzing these. So for example, in New York, we use people v. DeBoer. And ultimately, what these cases are trying to determine is to balance public safety versus individual rights. And so what happens if individual rights are being violated when it comes to the Fourth Amendment? And that's what the exclusionary rule is. In 1961, there was a case map v. Ohio um, where the defendant was convicted of possession of obscene materials. There was an unlawful search of the house with no warrant and no consent. The lower court said the Fourth Amendment didn't apply to the states, only to federal law, but the Supreme Court said that the Fourth Amendment applies to the states as well, and you cannot use evidence obtained in violation of the Fourth Amendment. So just because something was found, it does not strengthen probable cause. So this slide is in gray because search and seizure cases are live in a gray area. Lots of times when we talk about these cases with investigators, they begin coming up with all kinds of hypotheticals. So can an officer do this? Can an officer do that? But generally, the actions that can be taken are determined by the totality of the circumstances. And each case tends to have a unique set of circumstances. The ultimate disposition regarding whether or not misconduct occurred is based on the justification of the actions, not simply the actions themselves. Hypothetical circumstances predispose that there is a black and white answer, but search and seizure law lives in the gray area, so careful legal research is required. And what's even more complicated is that the exclusionary rule happens in cases when someone is arrested for having something that they should not, such as weapons or narcotics. But many civilian complaints involve potential Fourth Amendment violations where no one was arrested. So it can be difficult to find comparable case law for someone who was never arrested and never had contraband. So what kinds of allegations should we consider when we are talking about search and seizure? Um, keep in mind that it's the actions that the determine which allegations that we're going to be pleading. And you should avoid broad categories of allegations because the legal justifications vary greatly among various types of actions and not all searches are the same. And subcategories should be pleaded separately. So some examples here include a stop, which is restricting the freedom of movement, but you may want to consider lesser intrusions as well. So situations where civilians can walk away if they choose. Um, you may want to plead arrests or detention separate from a stop. You should certainly plead a vehicle stop separate from a person being stopped on the street. Premises entered should be pleaded separately. A frisk is not a search. And even when we're talking about a search of a person, um, someone's pockets being searched would be different from their backpack or purse being searched um, or their cell phone 
or their vehicle or their home. So these are all examples that you would want to plead separately. So when you do know what you're going to be investigating, um, do keep in mind that when you're conducting a detailed investigation, that each person involved in an investigation from the victims to the witnesses to the officers can only tell you as much as they saw and felt and heard and experienced. A civilian can describe an officer as being five foot ten, but that doesn't mean that the officer is. So that is not an actual fact. And we need to be really careful when we're thinking about what is the fact versus subjective opinion. And I like this quote, we look at the world once in childhood, the rest is memory. Um, because ultimately, a lot of what is happening during these encounters is our own impressions based on our own experiences. So we need to be really careful and make sure that we are thinking about what is fact versus interpretation. And why are humans so fallible? Many students Many, sorry, many studies have concluded that the following impacts are memory of an incident. Witnesses are subject to high stress or anxiety. The human memory tends to reconstruct incidents because humans do not have the capability to record memories like a video recorder. Or witnesses often focus on weapons and not the identity of the perpetrator. So when you're looking for facts and trying to figure out what these are, the first thing you should confirm is the location of the incident via a database search. Does the address actually exist? Is it as described? Remember that Google Street View images can be outdated. Businesses can close, scaffolding can be erected or removed, and for example, in New York City, our public housing is not on Google Street View, so you can't even find it there. And also think about is the location on the border of jurisdictions. If the police department is broken into geographical units, is it on the border of patrol units? And make sure you confirm the time of the incident. Most people do not pause during an incident to look at their watch to confirm the time. The time of the incident as provided by civilians can be off by hours or sometimes even days. So look for official documentation such as a 911 call or arrest report which can provide you with an accurate time frame. And timeliness matters. Confirm the existence of all victims and witnesses immediately and begin contacting victims immediately. Because memories fade, and if witnesses are contacted months after an incident, they will lose faith in how seriously the investigation is being taken. And many people move or change phone numbers, and they can just disappear in the wind. So you want to lock down all of the people that you possibly can. And confirm the existence of video immediately, because most surveillance video is only available for one to two weeks. So once you confirm the location, reach out to businesses surrounding the incident and look on both sides of the street. You never know what their video is capturing. And call owners or management companies of residential buildings to determine if they have video as well. Don't make assumptions that someone won't have video. Call and confirm that they don't have video. Written statements are some of the most important statements obtained during an investigation because they're usually created at or near the time of the incident. And these contemporaneous accounts include civilians writing a statement about what happened, civilians filing a written complaint, officers documenting the incident in a memo book, or officers creating documentation regarding a stop, frisk, search, a vehicle stop, an entry into a home, or a summons, et cetera. So all written statements need to be obtained and carefully read. When conducting interviews, they should not conclude without first addressing any discrepancies between details in the written statement and details that were just provided during the interview. And keep in mind, when you're looking at video, video is not telling you the whole story. So um, keep in mind body camera versus personal video device versus surveillance footage, versus human guided surveillance, all have different views. You have to consider who is behind the camera, why is the camera rolling at that moment, and who controls when the camera is on and where it's pointed. And what is outside the frame? What is not being captured? How far away is the action? Does the angle change perception? Body-worn cameras are often positioned at chest level, and so that can distort the um, perception of what's happening versus something, a surveillance video that's higher and capturing more of the scene. And what was happening before the video be even began? And what happened after the video ended? 
is the video capturing fluid movement or just snapshots every few seconds? And does the camera pan back and forth and miss some of the action every few seconds? Could the video have been digitally edited or manipulated at any point? How did you obtain this video? And also think about who saw the video. Could it influence any subsequent interviews? So when you are interviewing people, there are different interviewing goals. With civilians, our goal is to obtain the details of the actions because this is where our allegations come from. But when we're interviewing officers, the details of justification for the actions is what leads to our disposition or outcome of the case. So this is a photo that I found. It's a, it's a stock image that I found on the internet that I use in training. Um, and there's a lot going on in this moment. We want to think about the fact that officers may make bad stops, but it's not arbitrary. There's some reason, even if it doesn't amount to reasonable suspicion. So here we see a photo. On the left, there's a cutoff sign that says, Welcome to the Mitchell Houses which is public housing in New York City. The man on the left is a white male wearing sunglasses, has brown hair, a pink shirt, blue jeans. You can see in his front right pocket, there is an oblong bulge. Um, and in his rear pocket, he has what looks like a wallet. And officers need to know what is a common innocuous object versus a weapon. But the officer is patting him on the inside of his left pants leg. And I don't see a bulge there. So these are all important details to think about. The male on the right, it's hard to tell from this angle, looks a little bit taller than the male on the left. He's a black male wearing a black t-shirt, black shorts. It looks like he has a baseball glove attached to his waistband. You cannot see where the officer's hand is, so you can't even see if the officer is touching him, but certainly it appears that the officer is reaching towards his waistband. And this is just a one second shot of this entire incident. And so we all of these details are really important. If there's a 911 call, if they're looking for someone, you know, if there was a victim of a crime who gave a description of people, where people are being touched by officers, all of these things are really crucial to us. So there's a lot of detail that we have to get when we are interviewing people in these cases. But the first thing that we need to do is lock down the setting. If we don't have a detailed description of the setting and where each person is situated, we can't evaluate what is reasonable to see and hear. And so here we see two shots of the exact same door from a slightly different distance. So in the shot on the left, you see a silver SUV right in front of the building. And if you're sitting in that SUV, it would be somewhat reasonable for you to be able to see the walkway to the front door of that building. But then you see in the second photo that the sedan that's parked right behind that SUV wouldn't even be able to see most of the walkway, let alone be able to see the front door. And the difference of one car length is the difference between being able to see action and not being able to see action. And so this can be really crucial in terms of what officers are able to see when they're making observations. So we really need to be careful about obtaining this information. And what I always tell investigators is, can you make a movie of the incident when you finish your interview? And not an artistic rendering, but a moment by moment uh, recreation of everything that happened. And so you really cannot make assumptions. This is a screenshot that's um, pretty much outside of my office building. It's Church Street at Park Place in New York City. And so if someone tells you that something happened at Church Street and Park Place, you really could be talking about any number of spots that are visible in this shot or not even visible around the corner. Um, and so if so, I tell investigators, if you're walking outside of our office, would you be able to see something happening at Church Street and Park Place? And it depends. We, we can't really answer that question because incidents rarely happen at the corner. So which street were the people on? Was it the north, the south, the east, the west? How close to the corner was it? Because all of these things really make a difference about what could be seen or heard or experienced. So it's important to set the scene before asking about the interaction and ask questions that help you evaluate the ability of the witnesses to observe the incident. Keep in mind distance, obstruction, lighting, distractions, et cetera. 
And have a civilian draw a map or diagram and sign and date it, which becomes a statement in itself. If you are using an image from Google Street View, make sure that you're describing everything for the record you are recording in the interview, because ultimately if the transcript just has someone saying, we started at this house here and then went that way, it's meaningless. So make sure that you're saying, you know, we were standing in front of this yellow house on this image, and then we moved towards the red brick house. And also keep in mind that what is there is as important as what is not there. So make sure that both things are being documented for the record. When, in terms of medical diagnoses, there's something called the pertinent negative. So for example, if the symptoms of chicken pox are high fever, fatigue, and rash, when diagnosing a patient, you cannot say the patient has a high fever and fatigue to determine the diagnosis. You have to specify high fever, fatigue, and no rash. If you don't say no rash, it leaves open the possibility that there is a rash. And it's the same thing when we're doing these interviews. Um, if, there is, if there are no street lights, we need to say there are no street lights. And when we're talking about vehicle stops, what people see inside a vehicle is dependent on where they are situated in the vehicle, if the vehicle is mobile or stationary, where the vehicle is in relation to the action outside of the vehicle, so is the vehicle next to the curb on the opposite side of the street, is there a row of parked cars, how many lanes of traffic are there on the street, etc. What is the lighting like? Is it daytime or nighttime? Are there street lights? Um, are there any obstructions? Um, such as scaffolding, would you be able to see what is in someone's hands given the above? That's often tr what we are trying to figure out with these questions. And also keep in mind, once people are outside of a vehicle, where were they specifically in relation to the vehicles and each other? You can't tell if anyone can reasonably see things if you don't know where they are, so don't assume. And where I stand next to a vehicle can dramatically alter what I can see inside. So if I am a police officer approaching a vehicle, if I'm standing next to the bumper, what I can see inside the vehicle is very different from what I can see if I'm standing next to the back passenger door versus if I'm standing next to the driver's side door. And in this, when you're inside of a home as well, we have to be really careful about what facts we are gathering. If someone says to you, I was sitting on the sofa in the living room and there was a knock on the door, my sister answered it and only opened the door a little bit and then officers forced their way in, we still have a lot of questions that we have to ask here. The first is, how big is the living room? And where is the sofa in the living room? And where is the living room relative to the door? Can you see the door from the sofa? We really can't assume any of these things. Oftentimes what happens is people will tell us all of the facts that they have sort of gathered themselves and present them to us, not trying to be misleading, trying to be helpful, but oftentimes we're making assumptions based on what they're telling us. So it's really important that we break things down. And this is how we determine the basis of knowledge, or how do you know that to be true? Because in this case, the sofa being a few feet away and directly across from the door with an unobstructed view is very different from the sofa being in a living room where the door is not even visible, and the sister told him later that she opened the door a little bit and the officers forced their way in. And also when people use terms like, my sister answered it, what exactly does that mean? Um, it, sometimes it seems silly to be asking about something that seems relatively clear, but did she say something or do something or did someone else say or do something? If there was a conversation, how do you know that conversation took place? You're trying to determine if the civilian heard it or found out later from the sister or was just assuming. Because ultimately, when we interview the sister, if she says something different, we need to be able to account for the inconsistency. Either it was something the person on the sofa could not see or hear, and therefore it's not a credibility issue, or if it was something the civilian on the sofa could have seen and heard, it does become a credibility issue. And so with the basis of knowledge, we're trying to figure out, you know, do you know that to be true because you saw it? Or do you know that to be true because someone told you? And if that is the case, who told you? When were you told this? 
if you could hear but not see, how do you know how far the door was opened? If you did not find this out until you were at the station house, why did you make the arrest at the scene? Did you assume something did not happen because you did not hear anything about it, i.e. the absence of information? And again, that pertinent negative. So I didn't hear her say they could enter our apartment, so I'm assuming she did not give them consent. He didn't complain to me about pain to his face, so I'm assuming he was never punched. He didn't tell me anyone offended him, so I'm assuming no one used offensive language, and no one told me there was a gravity knife in the car, so I'm assuming it was found in the civilian's pocket. And keep in mind that when you're interviewing parties, each civilian and officer needs to be interviewed separately. No third party should be present to maintain the integrity of the investigation. A parent or guardian needs permission before minors can be interviewed. When you are conducting interviews, the best way to begin is to obtain an uninterrupted narrative of the incident. This can last from one minute to five minutes usually. People don't spend 20 minutes telling you what happened. And then you'll wanna go back and ask open-ended questions. This allows the person to tell his or her own story. And those are the who, what, where, when, why, how types of questions. And we always want to begin with the beginning to get the whole picture. The narrative should not start with the police interaction. We need to try to figure out what caused the police interaction in the first place. So we need to go back in time before that even began. And the narrative should end when the officers leave and are not seen again. And we really want to avoid reading questions such as questions that suggest the answer. Were you concerned when he suddenly reached under the seat? Or questions that only allow for a yes or no response. Did you have any bulges in your pocket? This leading question in particular always bothers me because ultimately what we're trying to determine is, did you have anything in your pocket? That's what we want to know. Or what did you have any, well really what we want to know is what did you have in your pocket? And ultimately, someone can say, no, I didn't have any bulges because they're thinking that you're implying they had a weapon or something they shouldn't have in their pocket. So if they say no, it doesn't mean they didn't have something in their pocket, and it doesn't mean they didn't have something in their pocket that was causing a bulge. So if, the, so if what you want to know is what was in your pocket, ask that question instead. And even asking someone, do you remember something is a leading question because it gives them an out. It gives them the opportunity to say, they know I don't remember, instead of making them think about what was really happening. And obviously, you want to, to avoid asking questions that reflect a bias, such as, so you knew you were just harassing them, didn't you? Ultimately, the reasons that we don't want to ask these questions is because leading questions inhibit the ability of the person being interviewed to provide detailed and reliable information. Never try to lock people into the story of what you believe happened, um, because you may discover there were things that were happening that you did not even know about. In all civilian and officer interviews, you need to determine when the incident began. Where were people prior to the incident? Did anyone leave and return? Did anyone stop to talk? Why were you patrolling this area? Was there a particular condition? What went over the radio? What happened at the tactical meeting? Attribute specific actions to specific people. It's very common for people being interviewed to say, first they did this, then they did that. But we need to break that down more specifically and just focus on what each person was doing at each moment. Interview everyone as both a subject and a witness of the statement. Don't get so caught up in the story they're telling about what happened to them that you forget to check in and find out what was happening with other civilians or other police officers at the scene because they can provide important testimony to us about what was happening with everyone else. Obtain all of the factors that caused the officers to begin the incident and take the actions that they took. Obtain all of the justifications for each action an officer takes, and we'll be getting back to that. And remember, when you question people, chronology is really key in interviewing. We want to obtain a chronological sequence of events. Don't let the subject drag you through the story, and really keep them focused. An incident is a series of moments or points in time, and it's confusing if you go from point A to point C, 
then back to point B, then to D, and then back to A again. And people will also feel interrogated if you jump through moments in time. So also remember that actions are taken as the result of what someone is seeing and hearing and feeling and interpreting. So you will need to obtain all of the factors that could have led to a specific action prior to discussing the action itself. We don't want to talk about the frisk and then find out why they performed the frisk because the subject can then start backfilling the justification for the action. So if the person had a bulge in his or her pocket or wasn't removing his or her hands from his pockets, then we need to know that before they start talking about the frisk, not after. Then what happened is probably my favorite interview question. For each point in time, begin with broad questions and then ask more detailed questions about only that point in time. So when you finish point A, begin point B by asking, then what happened or what happened next? Don't make so many assumptions about what was happening that you are leading the discussion. Remember that as you ask about each portion of the incident, you want to check in and see if people have moved at all as well. And we, you know, ultimately what can often happening, happen when we're interviewing people is we make assumptions about when the action really began. So don't assume that when officers put on their lights and sirens, the civilian car immediately pulls over. Don't assume when the civilian car pulls over, the next moment is an officer speaking to the driver, et cetera. We really want to focus on asking what happened next or then what happened. It sounds a little bit crazy to say that when you're interviewing people in search and seizure cases, you should avoid using the words frisk and search, but you should, because ultimately there are distinct legal differences, and many times people don't understand what these differences are, and they'll use the terms in inaccurate ways. And so we need to make sure that we're using words that everyone can understand so we're all on the same page. So use the words pat down instead of frisk, Use the word enter instead of search, and keep in mind what is in the pockets or the areas being frisked or searched. Just because a frisk of one pocket is justified, it doesn't mean that frisking all pockets could be justified. During vehicle stop interviews, use the word enter instead of search. Did the officer enter the vehicle? Through which door? What portion of his or her body? What did the officer do? Use touched or opened instead of search. Did he or she touch anything? Where? Did he or she open anything? Where? Just because a search of the driver's seat is justified, it doesn't mean that a search of all the seats could be justified. And keep in mind that when a civilian says something like, the officer searched my car with a flashlight, it doesn't necessarily mean that the officer even breached the plane of the vehicle. It could just be that the officer was shining their light into the car from outside. And when we're talking about incidents that happen inside of someone's home, again, use enter instead of search. Use look around or touch or open instead of the word search. And think about the difference between opening a closet and looking inside, and then taking out a shoebox and opening that. Because there are distinct legal differences between looking for a person and looking for evidence. And so we need to keep all of these differences in mind when we're asking our questions. And always keep in mind, if you're hearing something that sounds like innocuous behavior, make sure that you confront it and ask why such innocuous behavior seems troubling in this circumstance. So, for example, if he was reaching towards the glove box when you approached the driver's side window, why did you assume he was reaching for a weapon instead of getting his registration and insurance? If you didn't see anything happening after Mr. Smith passed money to Mr. Jones, why did you assume it was a hand-to-hand -hand transaction as opposed to Mr. Smith just giving money to Mr. Jones? And given the size and shape of the bulge you just described, what type of weapon did you think it was? Why? Why didn't you think it was a wallet or a cell phone, et cetera? Think back to that photo that we saw a few slides ago of the man with the wallet in his back pocket. That an officer would need a really good explanation to say that the officer thought that was actually a weapon and what type of weapon it was as opposed to a wallet. So we really want to confront innocuous behavior.
And then ultimately, we do want to know what an officer's understanding of rules are, even if the officer, it turns out, maybe wasn't present for the entire incident. Ultimately, we can't ask officers hypothetical questions, such as, well, if you had been there, would you have authorized this entry? But it's not a hypothetical question to ask an officer what his or her understanding of rules are. So for instance, what is your understanding of when officers can forcibly enter an apartment if they have an arrest warrant? Or, for example, and this is based on a case that we actually had, um, what is your understanding of who has final decision-making authority when the NYPD is working with the DEA on a narcotics thing? And the answer was, it can be complicated. It depends on who had the lead on the investigation. It's not a hypothetical question to then ask, who did have the lead on the investigation for this incident? And regardless of what the response is, the DEA or the NYPD, then we can ask, so who had the final decision-making authority for this incident? And then the DEA or the NYPD, you know, whatever the answer is, and then we always want to ask according to what rule or patrol guide procedure. We can't just assume that officers always know exactly what the rules are, and we always have to prove it. So it's helpful for us if they tell us what the rule is, then we can go back to our desk, look up the rule, print it out, and use it in our analysis when we finish the investigation. Always keep in mind that when officers say, I feared for my safety, this statement is not sufficient by itself to justify any action. We really need the officer to tell us what specific factors made him or her fear for his or her own safety. <coughs> and as I had alluded to before, and I've mentioned a few times, I think already, it's really important that we get the officer's justification for the actions that he or she took. We always have to ask them why they did what they did. It's not just a matter of what they did. But we also need to ask them when they give us their justification, is there anything else? Were there any other reasons? We can't assume that officers know what they have to provide to us. And so you need to ask enough questions to make sure you have obtained all of the justifications for the action that the officer took. Officers need to provide a justification for each action as well. So don't assume that the justifications for the frisk can then just be applied to the vehicle search. We need to ask them to provide a whole new set of justifications for the vehicle search. And they may be the same justifications, and that's fine, but they have to provide those to us. We can't just make assumptions. And then once all of the justifications are provided, we always need to make sure that there's nothing left out by asking anything else. And if they say no, nothing else, then we can move on. And this is really important because we want to make sure that the officer has every opportunity to give us all of the justifications because we don't want to come to a dis disposition that's misleading because the officer didn't realize that we wanted to know everything, not just the main justifications. And then ultimately, if the case does go to trial, it prevents the officers from adding new justifications while on the stand. You don't want an officer to pr provide new justifications on the stand and then say, well, I wasn't asked about them when I was being interviewed, so that's why I'm providing them now. So when you are ready to conclude the investigation, the investigation can conclude when you have finished gathering all of the facts, which includes the interviews, obtaining video footage, various documentation of the incident, including police documents, medical records, if applicable, court transcripts, et cetera. And then the next step is trying to determine what actually happened, if we can. And keep in mind, there may be more than one version of events. So we need to think about what are the commonalities between what the civilians told us and what the officers told us, or even what are the commonalities among the civilian statements, because they may have differing statements, or the commonalities among the officer statements, because they may also have differing statements. Um, and then we need to think about what are the differences, and then what are the factors that led to the justification for each action. Make sure that you do careful research of the rules, and that will be dependent on the various factors at play. 
Different version of events means that a careful reading of case law is necessary. We need to look at case law based on, you know, the version A and version B, because if they were both okay, then it will be okay. If only one version was justified, then maybe another version is not. And so we want to be really careful when we're researching case law. Is it still justified in all of these versions or not? And the analysis is not simply did this action happen or not. The analysis is the factors at play and the justifications presented in the context of the rules. Um, many times you can have a case where everyone agrees that a frisk occurred, but the reasons the frisk occurred are differing. So consider your standard of proof. Is it a preponderance of the evidence for such as in civil trials? Is it clear and convincing evidence for civil trials or is it beyond a reasonable doubt for criminal trials? And finally, Keep in mind that given the complexities involved in interpreting what happened, it's generally helpful to have more than one person reviewing the investigation and the final analysis. Again, as I had talked about earlier, these cases really live in the gray area. And sometimes it can be difficult finding applicable case law, particularly when we have a case where someone was not arrested. And the case law that we're looking at involves people who were arrested. So it's really helpful to not just have the investigator looking at the case law, but having a supervisor maybe, and if you have an attorney on your staff, looking as well. So that way, there can be a robust discussion about what really happened and whether the actions were justified. And keep in mind that subtle differences can end up being an important part of the outcome. You may want to consider putting together a know your rights type of checklist that you can provide to civilians through your office or at outreach events as well. And you might wanna give those out to people when they come into your office um, or at various outreach events. But again, you have to be careful when you're putting something like that together because laws do change from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And that is the conclusion of my lecture. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that informative and detailed presentation. Um, I myself found it very helpful and I, I feel that our attendees did it as well. We do have a few questions that people have already started to queue up. If you do have a question, please feel free to type it in and we will answer them in the order that they are received. The first one is back, um, has to do with one of the first two slides that you showed. Um, okay. The slide listed sources of law as federal and state mm -hmm. constitutions, state law, um, and they asked why not federal law as a clarifying question. Well, federal law is important too to consider, um, but ultimately the detailed actions of what officers can do in a specific jurisdiction is going to be, um, it will be more helpful to be looking at state law because again, we want to think about the ceiling versus the floor. And so the sort of general type of legal guidelines um, may be may not be applicable to what you're talking about because there may be more specific guidelines for your jurisdiction. So we want to be really careful. Um, if you're looking at federal law, um, you also want to look at state law as well. Thank you. Our next question is because the officers justifying the search often relies on their interpretation of the situation or feeling in addition to what was actually seen or heard. How do you weigh the feeling against the fact when completing an investigation and coming to a conclusion, particularly when you are asking for, quote, justification for each action? Right. Well, ultimately, when we're asking officers for justifications, it's then sort of up to them to provide facts versus just gut feelings. Um, and ultimately, gut feeling alone is not enough, um, such as when I was talking about the slide that said, you know, I feared for my safety. That alone is not enough of a justification. We really need to know, well, what was happening that made you fear for your safety? You know, the person was taking a certain stance and then the person put their hand in their pocket and there had been a bulge in the pocket that was, you know, a description that looked like the size of a knife. And so then 
um, I was concerned and the civilian wouldn't take his or her hand out of the pocket, you know, something like that. We really need them to provide a lot of details for us. And ultimately, if they provide a justification that has no real detail to it, then it means that it's not enough of a justification. They can't just say, I had a gut feeling. That's, that's really not what the court, any courts allow. And so ultimately, if they're just sort of providing justifications that are based on hunches and gut feelings, then it means that the actions were not going to be justified. And, and that's what you'll talk about when you're writing up the conclusion of your investigation, and that's how you're going to come to your disposition. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Um, next, if case law says a particular search would have led to evidence being suppressed, does that mean the officer committed misconduct? Or is there a different standard for misconduct than there is for suppression? Can you speak about the difference? Well, ultimately, when there are trials where there's an exclusionary hearing and something is being excluded, you know, ultimately, um, if the courts determine, you know, for instance, officers found a gun, but the way they went about finding the gun um, was determined not to be justified by the court, then the gun won't be usable in the trial. And that's ultimately what's happening in those hearings when the exclusionary rule applies. Um, you know, it sort of depends on what was happening in the very specific case. Um, ultimately, if the officer's you know, sort of, if they took steps that were ultimately the judge determined were not okay, then the gun will be suppressed and the case will generally fall apart at that point and the case simply won't move forward. In terms of officers being held to a standard that they're in trouble for something that they did, um, I think that's, that's rarer and it would, it would have to be something far more serious, such as, you know, planting evidence on someone or something like that. Um, but again, with these cases, you know, it, a lot of it really depends on the specific incident itself and what was happening in that specific case to really make a determination. But ultimately, when you're having exclusionary hearings, um, officers are not getting in trouble for that. It's just more that the case falls apart. Okay. Next, can you address how one goes about if you can determine what happened, whether misconduct occurred, and the applicability of administrative judicial decisions? Is it simply a question of whether the search was legal, or is there more to it than that? I'm sorry, could you, I think I missed the beginning of the question. Could you read that again? Can you address how one goes about determining what happened, whether misconduct conduct occurred and the applicability of administrative judi judicial decisions? In, in terms of, I'm sorry, could you, could you read it one more time? Yeah, and actually, why don't we move on to the next question and the person who posed that question, if you could resend that. I, I think that there is a word or two missing in, in the question and maybe they can resend that. Um, and we'll move on to the next one until we hear back from them. Okay. Um, okay. Do you have it? Next one is Do you have any expertise on the time frame for accurate witness testimony? Is it more accurate if given less than 30 days from the initial incident? You know, it's hard to sort of lay claim to something like that specifically. Um, I don't know of any studies in particular that have said, you know, specifically 30 days or 45 days or 90 days um, makes a difference in terms of memory. Um, you know, there are a lot of factors that impact what can influence someone's memory of an incident. You know, some of them we spoke about earlier. And so ultimately, some people, you know, you can interview them the next day and they may not remember all of the details and, and trauma certainly causes fragmentation of memory. But ultimately, we do know that if you're interviewing someone six months after an incident, their memory is not going to be as crystal clear as if you interviewed them a week or two after an incident. You know, if someone asked you, what did you wear to work last Thursday, um, you know, it you might be able to still remember, but you're going to have to think a lot about it. Whereas if I had asked you what you wore to work yesterday, you'll be able to remember that more clearly. And of course, that was not a loaded, complicated 
question to be asking or something to think about. So ultimately, we just know from our own experiences that we can tend to forget details of things. So there is no specific guideline about, you know, if you've reached a certain point in time, it's not worth contacting people. It's always worth contacting people to see what they can remember and tell you. But ultimately, if you are interviewing someone, you know, months after an incident, we do have to keep in mind that they may not be able to remember the incident with as much detail as they would have at the beginning. So our goal is to try to interview people as quickly as possible. Okay. Speaking of the details, uh, the next question is, can you address the importance in search and seizure cases of questioning civilians and officers regarding skin color, race, and appearance, such as clothing. Right, well, as I talked about with that specific slide, um, we do need to, as, uh, sorry, the slide with the photo of the two men who were, um, had their hands against the wall outside of the public housing building. You know, there are a lot of factors that are really important in these cases. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and so, we really do have to address a lot of detail. We do need to know what race people are. We do need to know what clothing they were wearing. And we need to know this one because if there was a description from a civilian who was a victim of a crime, then we need to know if, you know, someone is described that photo with the two men, you know, if it was described as a 17 year old white male who was 5'5", five five, and a 15-year-old Hispanic male who was also 5'5", five five, then those two men do not match that description, you know, or, you know, and they were both wearing gray t-shirts and jeans, you know, those two men would not have matched that description. So we do need to ask a lot of details about people's race, their height, their weight, you know, their body type and what they were wearing because we need to know if they're going to match a description or not and then ultimately what people are wearing too we want to know what's in their pockets what the clothing sort of looked like on their body as well so we can determine if it could have possibly looked like there was a weapon in any of their pockets those are really the main things that we want to think about because those that's what officers are looking at does someone match a description or do I have reason to believe that someone might have a weapon on them? That's what officers are usually concerned with. And so we need to rule those things in or out. And so we do have to ask a lot of detailed questions of civilians, and then we have to ask the same questions of officers as well. Great. So Jennifer, next we have a couple of questions that are somewhat similar. In the first one, if a court has made a de determination that a search or seizure was not justified, should that finding be imported over into an administrative investigation or should the investigator make an independent evaluation? Certainly, um, the, what the courts are deciding impacts what officers can and cannot do. So if a court decides on a Monday that officers were not justified in certain actions that they took, then absolutely we should be, you know, up to date with what the courts are deciding. And this is why it's, it can be really complicated in these cases um, because the law is subtly changing all of the time. There can be different, judges can interpret things differently um, or maybe there will be a fact pattern that ultimately they determine in that case it's different from the cases that had already been decided that had sort of set up the guidelines for when a certain action is okay. Um, but ultimately, that's, that's what's happening, you know, all the time in court. And so we do need to be really careful with the court law and the case law, but we also need to be careful and make sure that the patterns match the patterns of our case as well. And that's where it ends up getting very complicated because there are so many unique factors at play in every case. It is rarely something sort of general. And so finding case law that matches can be difficult. It takes time. You know, you really have to set aside a few hours for sure to 
research case law and really look into what is going to be applicable for your specific incident. Taking that question in with some subtle differences, um, the next question is, the, what if the investigator determines the search was not lawful? Does that mean the officer committed misconduct? Or is there a different standard set by the administrative disciplinary hearing? Well, ultimately, if the an investigator can only determine that a search was not lawful if they have rules to back that up. So ultimately, if it's case law, if it's, you know, the sort of patrol guide that the officers use and things like that, I mean, that's ultimately what the investigator's job is, is to determine based on the rules that officers have to follow, based on the Fourth Amendment, based on state law, based on the patrol guide that they have to follow, were they acting properly? And so ultimately, the determination as to whether or not that occurred is based on those sources of law. And then, yes, and then ultimately, um, that depending on the jurisdiction of the investigative unit, that would be an administrative issue to handle. Um, I know that many of the organizations in NACOL have all different kinds of jurisdictions um, and how the ultimately if misconduct is determined, ha who, determine, who has the final say at that point. Um, but yes, ultimately if the investigator using all of these rules determines that a search was not okay, then that would be dealt with by you know, whatever administrative hearing is the result or, you know, whoever is making the final determination as to what kind of discipline is going to occur. I think that we have time for one more question. Um, and, I, and I believe that this probably stems from um, you having said uh, the phrase takes time several times today throughout the, the mm -hmm. presentation. So the CCRB is a very large agency providing oversight to a very large police department. What, if mm -hmm. any, advice do you have for smaller agencies with staff that often wear different hats trying to do the same work? What should the priorities be? Right. Well, that is a very good question. And, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it, is very, it is incredibly difficult work that, um, that everyone is doing. And in smaller jurisdictions, it is really difficult. Um, ultimately, um, you, you do want to be careful with the details of what you are obtaining. I mean, oh, the most important thing is to make sure that you're really getting at the facts of what happened. And that's always the most important thing, because then at the end of the day, how the facts add up is really, um, you know, going to be something that a bunch of people can sort of look at and determine. Um, or, you know, if you have a smaller unit, then ultimately, you know, a smaller group of people are going to be looking at that and trying to determine how the facts add up. But your focus should really be on obtaining the facts of what happened, um, trying to get details of the statements. Um, obviously, things like being able to hunt for video if you have a really small staff is difficult. Um, but if you can, if you can find video, it can often be incredibly helpful for the rest of your investigation. Um, so, um, unfortunately, I think sort of depending on the size of your staff is sort of how going to depend on how you um, divvy up the responsibilities as well and, and what you can reasonably accomplish given the size of your staff. Um, but I do know that it, at the CCRB, we do have the luxury of having a larger staff um, where we are able to um, be really careful. But we also, you know, we have 36,000 police officers who we are having to account for as well. So it is, it is a lot of people that we are investigating. Well, with that, I want to thank you again, Jennifer, for joining us today and, and sharing this wonderful presentation with us. And I want to thank everyone who attended today's session and, and in advance thank them for, for taking a moment to complete the online survey that will be sent to you as soon as the webinar concludes. We are also currently finalizing the next webinar in our 2018 series. 
which will take place on July 31st. Please stay tuned for additional details and registration information that will be posted to the NACO website in the next few weeks. In addition to the upcoming webinar, we have several other training events coming up on June 28th. We hope you will join us in Seattle, Washington for one of our regional training and networking events. And of course, registration is open for our 24th annual conference, which will be held in St. Petersburg, Florida, September 30th through October 4th. Additional information on these and future NACOL training events can be found on our website, which is www.nacol.org backslash training. We once again thank you for joining us and we look forward to having you at our next event.